You're listening to Driving Law, a podcast by Kyla Lee about all things related to the rules of the road. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Driving Law. I am Kyla Lee, and with me, yet again, where we where oh yeah, I was trying to remember what did we do for the podcast last week, but it's all just kind of slipped away. My co-hostess with the most, just Paul Doroshenko. I think you should say, you know, like welcome again to another dynamic podcast. But I always say the same thing. I know, but I think you could, you know, you could make it more fun and exciting. Because uh, people tell me they listen to the podcast and they find it fun and exciting. And well, then why would I make it more fun and well, exciting if should, it's I already think you should explain status. that it is fun and exciting so people know they can be you know, prepared for the fun and the excitement. Welcome to the fun and exciting world of driving law. It is exciting. Yeah, it is. It is very exciting. Yeah. And there's so much to talk about. There's a lot to talk about. We've been busy. We have been. Oh, my God. We've been so busy. Like, I feel like, you know, it's, it's my end of year. So I've got all this like business financial aspect stuff business to do, but on top stress of work, yeah. on top of work and like my accountants, like when can we meet? I'm like, I don't know, six months from now. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I had all this time and I was producing all this creative stuff and expending all this fun energy. And now it's just, it's like busier than it was before. I'm Somehow. counting on the October slowdown. We have a, yeah. traditionally we have a slowdown in October and everybody thinks, oh, maybe Halloween it'll pick up. Yeah, good, it it's a good time up. for your you know, end of year of the, your business. Uh, yeah, well, but. October would be better than September because September is always busy because yeah. everybody's like getting back into, into gear in life and they're out doing things and they out, are out doing things and they get in trouble. Yeah. Um, so, but, um, and the police officers who were all on vacation in August are back working. They're back. Uh, they're bored. All the they courts got are stats. back. Prosecutors are back. Everybody's back. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly they're phoning you and you're making deals and resolving things and getting things done. Going to get things done. Going to get things done. Yeah. So. But now it's October and hopefully we can enjoy an October slowdown. Something that used to terrify me um, when we were a firm of a couple of people. I got to tell you, there's no October slowdown. I've got like four trials coming well, up. Well, we haven't had a, we have usually have a slowdown in, in new work. Right. That doesn't uh, matter. But <laughs> these days we have so much work under, you know, work, work, work underway that yeah. it's not really going to slow down. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, nice uh, success we had today for Sarah McDonald. She had a, um, uh, fairly heavy notice of intent and uh, made the submissions on behalf of the client and they canceled the driving prohibition entirely. Well, good work, Sarah, yeah. at Acumen Law. Yeah. She did a great job. <laughs> well, she's quite, quite happy about it, walking around the office all oh, smiley yeah. today. No, uh, no I kidding. Know, I was like, I handed her the envelope because, you know, I, I check the mail. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things it's to do. It's your job. Well, it's one of my favorite things to do. It's like... Paul's it's, daily tasks. It's like make Christmas. Coffee. Check mail. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I, I fit it turn, into a... Turn the heat down to a temperature everybody can bear because Kyla turned it up to 25 degrees when she came in at 7 o'clock. <laughs> I have a pattern. I have some patterns. Yes, you do. Um, okay. But I want to tell you about my exciting week because I spent most of it. Why are you shaking your head? You don't want to hear about my no, exciting you, week? you can go ahead. I just, you know, you make it sound like your week's more exciting than mine. Anyway, well, you, you checked there. the mail, you turned down the heat. I took care of your dog. And you looked after my dog. But I wanted to connect it to driving law. I'm okay. going somewhere. Okay, go ahead. People don't come to the podcast to just listen to us banter. The inane banter of the lawyers. Anyway, yeah. go on. <laughs> so I went to Grand Prairie, Alberta this week to do a trial, an impaired driving trial. Yeah. And I got to uh, see one of my favorite people from Alberta while I was there, Tim Foster oh, okay. from Tim. Road Lawyers. Lovely. Yes, he is out of Calgary, but he happened to be in Grand Prairie for a trial the day before my trial. So when I was arriving, he was leaving. So he, very... he, uh, he has a lot of matters in Grand Prairie. Yes. For some reason. Very busy all yeah. over Alberta. He's just, he's really good. Yeah. There were, I was 
telling lawyers in the barrister's lounge about Tim and and like they, he picked me up at the airport and we had dinner and it was so nice and they were like oh he's like such a good lawyer like if I got an impaired that's who I'd hire so that's what they were saying yeah oh okay yeah so I I wouldn't dispute that if you get an impaired in Alberta you should hire Tim Foster I, stop I, hiring me <laughs> we, we've sent we've sent people to hire yeah Tim. please hire Tim <laughs> well there's lots of British Columbians want you to go I know. and do their trial and mm. I understand that you know, I've, I had an incredible run in Alberta. It's 20 years, and I used to do one to two a year, and I never lost somehow. And lots of times I walked out of there, and I didn't know how I won, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim was telling me about changes in Alberta, and we now know a date certain for the big D-Day. The drop. IRPs in Alberta, December 1st. Uh, so they're right doing at the it for beginning the of counterattack. For, yeah, well, it's not counterattack in Alberta. It's check stop season. Whatever. Check stop. Whatever they call it. So they're having immediate roadside prohibitions. It's the same thing, 90 days on the basis of a fail, right? Um, I think they actually do 90 days on the basis of an approved instrument, but they've got check stop buses. Yeah. So it's easy for them to get the approved instrument sample. Well, it's better evidence if they're using an approved instrument, depending Is on the it? instrument. They use the Intox ECIR2. Well, the Intox ECIR2 is basically an Alco sensor for um, put into a box with some duct tape. It's taped inside a box. I know yeah. I try to explain this to people. I'm like, it looks big, but it's not that heavy. And when you open it up, I mean, once you take the gas standard out, when you open it up, you see it's mostly just empty space. I was going to make a video. I was going to take one of them apart so people could see what's in there. See, but then everything got busy again and you didn't have time. And I didn't have time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can still do it. You can still do it. I, I believe in you. I have to find time. There's an Intox ECI or two next door to where we are recording this. There's 10 of them in there, probably. There's, there's 16, I believe. There's at least two 15, of them. 15, because we gave one to Chuck. I don't know. There's at least two of them that have a factory defect in it. Yes. And Don't give it away. I've been waiting for the day well, that Chuck we have is to deal with that. helping us out on that. Well, that's a different issue. I don't know what he's doing on that, but I have talked to Chuck about it a few times. Have you had Chuck on the podcast? No, we should have Chuck on the podcast. Chuck, Chuck Rathburn. A, Chuck Rathburn, who is based in... Indiana. Indiana. And he's not just a lawyer. He's also an expert testifying for the defense on breath-testing instruments. So He was a journalist before or something, wasn't he? Yeah. He's, yeah. like, lived many lives. He's also fantastic and just a nice guy. Yeah, he's great. Um, so, yeah, we big D-Day, Alberta, December 1st. All your rights are gone, basically. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, courts. <laughs> Back in the yeah. day, the charter mattered. And, you know, you think about it every generation. There was somebody asked me something about, well, that's certainly going to be found to be unconstitutional uh, the other day, and I thought, and I answered and I said, no, I, I have no idea. I have no idea anymore because things that I think would have been found unconstitutional 20 years ago um, with a change in, you know, now we've got a bunch of baby boomer judges, um, you know, not people who lived through the Second World War uh, and not people who have a, you know, a, a direct memory of that, of uh, fighting totalitarianism, why we got the charter and so forth. Um, we and, all have a current memory of fighting totalitarianism. I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on in the world, but we are in the midst of fighting totalitarianism. Um, it's not quite the same. And, uh, you know, Brian Dixon, uh, it's not the same, lost his leg and, uh, you know, you know flying, COVID-19 yeah. isn't the Spanish flu. We're still calling it a pandemic. Donald Trump has not committed to a peaceful transfer of power. He has not denounced white supremacy or neo-Nazi groups and, in fact, told the Proud Boys to stand down it, and stand it, by. I got it. I watched it all. I watched it all. I know all of that. What I'm telling you is that the, the current lot of judges are people who were born and raised after the Second World War, and they don't have that same contemporaneous memory. They lived through the, the hippie generation, and I, I don't think that they are as... Uh, as equipped as the previous judges to think about the oppressive apparatus of the state. And so things that I think would have been found unconstitutional um, 20 years ago now might just, you know, pass. Well, now I think that the lawyers of my generation, when we become judges, not me included there, of course, but, you know, when the, my contemporaries become judges, they will be very charter positive sure i think the gen x judges will be too 
but it's the baby boomer judges are the ones I I'm not enthusiastic about. Well, and every generation changes. Speaking people, of people change, things change, <laughs> the seasons change, the leaves change. To everything, turn, turn, oh. turn. <laughs> As long as you don't sing California Dream and I'm okay. Okay, um, all right, go ahead. Speaking of. Yeah, well, you've ruined my transition there. But um, there was a recent BC Supreme Court decision. Oh, really? This week, yes. In fact, there were many BC Supreme Court decisions. But ah, the okay. one I want to talk to you about <laughs> is one involving a man um, who was dealing with Road Safety BC. And of course, you and I have talked before on the podcast and just like literally every day of our lives about this incessant problem with Road Safety BC issuing notices of extension on IRPs. So you dispute your IRP, you're supposed to get your decision within 21 days, but the judge goes, oh, I don't have enough time to make a decision. I'm going to extend it. And usually extend it again and again and again. Yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know, 20% sometimes, 10%, um, but they just seem to go on for forever. And it doesn't and... mean you're not going to win. I mean, sometimes with the extensions, it feels to me like it's almost punitive. Like, I had one Wait client... Wait 60 days and before you revoke the driving prohibition? Oh, no. Let me tell you about the worst one that I'm still angry about. There's nothing I can do about it because I won. But this client had a report to superintendent that wasn't properly sworn. Now, so under that's the... A, that should be a three-minute decision. It shouldn't be a decision because under the Motor Vehicle Act, the obligation to revoke the prohibition when there's no properly sworn report is triggered before the hearing. It's notwithstanding Section 215.5, which is the provision but allowing sometimes you the... Have to, yeah, but sometimes you have to explain it to the adjudicator why it's not properly yeah, sure. sworn. But the provision allowing the hearing and the decision and the extensions are all in 215.5. 250.5 sub 7 gives the adjudicator the power to render a decision. But if the obligation to revoke is triggered before the power to extend, then that adjudicator extending that decision was unlawful extension. Unlawful. And she extended it without a stay of his driving prohibition until the 90 days were completed. Tell me that that's not punitive. Like on its face, it's like I can't fault you for this because you are statutorily obligated to have your prohibition revoked, but I'm going to punish you with the entire consequences of the prohibition anyway. It's wrong. Well... And what can you do? You can't sue them. You can't them. do anything. Um, you can't judicially review it. You could write every week to the Attorney General, but now we're in an election, so there's no Attorney General. Well, and... This is the government. Like, if the liberals are elected do i have any confidence that whoever they appoint as the attorney general is going to do they're, anything they're not going to be elected if the greens are elected do they they're, even they're have any idea elected. who the attorney general would be <laughs> like, they, 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 they wouldn't have anybody who could be the attorney general the 17, hey, they've got a 17 year old i was candidate. just gonna say yeah. the 17 year old candidate can be the ag she could be, she could be the attorney general <laughs> i'd take her over the former bc liberal attorney generals there are three of them shirley bond uh-huh well, she wasn't a lawyer. Yeah. Suzanne Anton? Yeah. And? She, she she was not much of an attorney general, in my view. And very short-lived attorney general, Andrew, Andrew Wilkinson. Andrew Wilkinson. Yeah. 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 Well, he wants to prohibit people, I think, from running down the street with a chainsaw. Yes. And uh, that is really where he's stepping on my toes, because when I do go running, I usually carry my chainsaw. I mean, as you know. I know a lot about you and your chainsaw obsession. I'm disappointed to hear that this has reignited it. Anyway, so back to the BC Supreme Court decision. So my frustration about the extensions and the way in which I think it is a calculated way to punish people, even though I can never prove it, but I'm going to say it on the podcast, let them sue me. Um, then I'll be able to examine them for discovery and prove it. Um, sue me, I dare you. Um, last time I said that they did sue me, though, so please don't sue me. <laughs> um, okay, the decision involved a case where there was an extension, and it said a decision will be rendered by, I don't know, September 25th. I'm making updates here. And then September 25th rolls around, no decision, nothing. It's not faxed to the applicant's lawyer until the 22nd, or the 
the next day. The, sorry, it was the 22nd in the judgment. I remember this now. So 21st, it was yeah. extended to the 22nd. They give themselves another extension. Is that no. what you're saying? No, no, no. They rendered a they decision. Rendered decision. But they rendered it a day later than they extended it to. And so the whole argument here that this individual was making was that they lost jurisdiction, right? And like people call us all the time and they say, oh, you know, they didn't render a decision on time. And um, I, that means that my prohibition just gets thrown out. And like, maybe it does, but probably not. Like I've looked into it. It is not a strong argument because a tribunal just doesn't lose jurisdiction if it doesn't render a decision. There's lots of case law on this from like the Human Rights Tribunal and the Employment Standards Tribunal. And it just... It's just treated as another extension. And well, and the difficult part with that is what do you have? If they don't render a decision, maybe ar arguably you could go get your license, but your license is canceled. So they're just giving themselves more time to render a decision. It's really just another extension that they haven't given you notice of. Exactly. And that's what the court's going to say. Like, I, I think I even got into this discussion with Madam Justice Saunders when I was at the Court of Appeal arguing Bowie, where she was like, well, what if this? And I suggested, well, then it would be a loss of jurisdiction. And she's like, no, I'm pretty sure that that would just be treated as another extension. And the decision itself would be treated as the notice of how long it was going to be extended for. But this case was fascinating because somebody in the appeals registry at Road Safety BC filed an affidavit saying our system shows that this letter at 327 was mailed to this person and faxed to his lawyer. And the court, essentially the, the crux of the decision turned on the difference between sending a decision and receiving a decision. Because he said he never got the letter, it never arrived at the address. I don't know how you can say it was mailed if you put it in a tray to be picked up by a postal worker at 327. Like, they've already come and gone, lady. Um, but apparently that's considered sending the decision, as far as mailing is concerned. And then the faxing, their system showed that it was faxed at that time. What the evidence didn't show is a fact that you and I know, which is that their fax is an e-fax. So they don't put it in a, you know, a Machine. fax trolla yeah. and feed it and watch it go through and, you know, page one of three, page two of three, page three of three. They click a button on a computer. They click a button on a computer and it goes into a queue. And they have no idea in this BC government fax queue how many tens, dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of faxes are ahead of them because it's one queue for all BC government faxes. They email us now, by the way. And yeah, that's only a pandemic thing. They started in the pandemic um, emailing us, but in part as well, because every time they tried to fax us, their queue was so overloaded that it would interrupt their transmissions and it would end up like we'd have like six failed transmissions just to get one decision because it's their computer's problem. We had our technicians, as you know, yes. come in, look at our machines and say, nope. Well, we tried two different machines two and different we tried fax on machines different lines and different phone lines. Yeah. And so they file this affidavit. The original lawyer for the client files an affidavit to say, I received it in my office on the 22nd. I know this because of the fax stamp. Also, my fax machine was working properly the day before. But it doesn't say how he knows that his fax machine was working properly the day before. And so the court says, well, this just appears to be a bare assertion without any facts to support it. Like, well, if it worked to receive the decision on the 22nd and he said it was working the day before, why, why, I think why, the inference why is... Why would the court make that assumption? It's so weird. Yeah, that's... The inference is that he was receiving faxes. He can't comment on it in an affidavit because those faxes are likely privileged. Well, it's not just that. If it was working the day before, you assume that it was working. Why would that be a question? How would that be? That, like, that's a credibility finding yeah, of the lawyer. Yeah, it was really like, weird. Weird. It was super weird. Unnecessary, too. Yeah. Um, and so, obviously, the court sided against him. But, saying, I mean, your fax they... machine could pack it in and be out of paper on the day before and well, you load it with the paper. Well, that's what the judge said. Thing. You but, know, he said but, it could have been out of paper. And but how, just where's the evidence of that? And he didn't explain what this timestamp meant. Well, he did explain what the timestamp meant. Well, where's the evidence of it, though? That it was, that out, it was of out of paper. Or there that isn't. Was, yeah. 
the judge is just like, being Where, like where's the evidence the, that a fax machine works all that way? All the things that I can imagine that that this date could be printed later on the decision, as opposed to the evidence of the lawyer that this is the date that it spat out of my machine. So it was decided on the fax? It was decided on the fax. On the fax? Time stamp. Yeah, fax? Yeah, yeah, I got, I got <laughs> you, I got fax, you. Fax, fax, fax. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, that was my best joke ever. I just thought it was a crazy decision, a weird set of facts, like an affidavit from somebody at road safety, an affidavit from a lawyer, an argument about a loss of jurisdiction. The court just says, Doesn't bother I with don't the have argument. to address it because I found that the decision was sent even if it was never received. And that's so stupid. Like, obviously, the point of the legislation when it says the decision has to be sent to the person, it serves a purpose. First of all, if you have an extension and you have a stay then you know your stay is expired because you get the decision and it, it, it imposes the prohibition on you. If you don't have a stay and your prohibition's being revoked, it creates your eligibility to get your license. And if it's sent, here's the other problem. If it's sent on the 21st, but received on the 22nd, Road Safety BC will only cover your towing and storage for your vehicle to the day they sent it. So it prejudices you to put put it as sent, not received. There's just so many easier ways to deal with that. I mean, you, you, it would be great if a judge was to say, you know, we see a number of these cases where these case decisions are not rendered. And the whole idea of this is that it was supposed to be fast uh, and, you know, expeditious and not particularly costly for people. And it starts to give the impression that this is not how it's happening when we see these cases but, but in this circumstance okay. i can't but it's okay because they wrote in a provision that allows the adjudicator to basically do whatever they want in an extension that wasn't in the first version of the scheme as yeah I they recall. had to reinstate the license and everything in the first version i can't remember if they had to reinstate the license no they didn't have to it was optional but the they always they, did they always did, they yeah. always did. Yeah, you're right. It was optional because there was one time they didn't and there was like a nasty exchange of letters. And then they did. And then they started just doing <laughs> and then it. They did. And then when the NDP got in, it just became like the policy now that they just keep prohibiting people even if you get your your IRP revoked. Yeah, even And if so you wonder what the considerations are at the other end. Yeah, especially because they're looking at the driving record as the basis to say you don't get a stay. So they might look at your driving record and be like, oh, you've had six previous IRPs. Well, Fuck the, you. <laughs> the upsetting thing is that we're seeing so many malfunctioning ASDs these days. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it just calls into question the reliability of the scheme. When the Alco Center FST now has been five years in service, the same amount of time that the Alco Center 4s were when they had to be pulled out of service because they were all defective. Yep. Um, anyway, moving on to another topic that will perhaps upset you, perhaps not. It upset me. What? We've talked a number of times on this podcast about the Chung case, the dangerous driving case. In on uh, Oak, Oak Street. Yep. Oak and 49th or 41st. I yeah, the guy, the speeding guy in his Audi blows through the intersection because he wants to make right the yellow. Right lane. Yeah. And uh, kills the left-turning beloved doctor. Left-turning? I thought he was turning right. The doctor was turning left. Mm. And he smashes into him and kills him. And Shitty. goes to the Supreme Court of Canada after he's acquitted at the BC Provincial Court because the judge says this driving is surprisingly disturbing as it is not unusual on Oak Street, which I think is accurate. Yep. Um, and then it went it's like to the... I can't the, call uh, it dangerous because I see it every day. Yeah. And then it went to the uh, Court of Appeal and they said, oh, these speeds, no matter what, are dangerous in a city on a 50 zone. And right, then it which went is not to, the test for dangerous driving. Well, it didn't seem it's to matter. And then departure. it went to the Supreme Court of Canada, and they said, well, you know, I'd have no problem finding this dangerous, but that's not the point. The point is the legal test, at which point then they just replaced the decision of the... Yep. Yep. <laughs> of the provincial court judge. So he was sentenced. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, eight, that was going to come. 18 months of jail. So you go from being acquitted, being out on bail this whole time with... No, nothing that we've heard anyway, it's the public, of any subsequent offenses or bad driving. Um, being once acquitted. So then now he's been convicted. Convicted and then convicted for sure. And then sent well, back to the Well, it's dangerous traffic. driving, but causing why death. Why jail? Why jail? What does jail do? Jail's not going to make people, like, not speed up. 
to that speed. Oh, I think it does. I think the fear of jail. I talk to people when they're charged with offenses and they're very up they're concerned about it going to jail. After. They're not afraid of it at the time that they're... People don't think about it at the time. Well, then okay, it's what, not what, a what would, Okay, sentence. I don't, I, I don't know the the uh, driver's personal circumstances. I don't know how this affected him. I don't know anything that's happened to him since or before. Um, if you just had person in front of you, person, driving like this on Oak Street and, and uh, Audi kills somebody, what would you give them as a sentence? Uh... $10,000 fine, five-year driving prohibition. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I would, I'd give him two years of jail. See, I... And a three-year driving prohibition. I just, well, I mean, to be fair, like, I'm basically a prison abolitionist. So the idea of sending somebody to jail to begin with, so hard. That's why I can't be a judge, because I can't send people to jail. Especially for shit that I don't think should be jailable offenses, like driving offenses. Well, um, there's not supposed to be too much focus on uh, general deterrence, and I would probably, you know, be thinking that I would want to put my focus on general deterrence. There's not supposed to be too much focus on general deterrence, but if you read the sentencing case law in driving cases, particularly in dangerous driving cases, the focus is is primarily on general deterrence and they basically say all of the cases go well you know most of the time we're not really supposed to focus on general deterrence but driving offenses since there's usually no need for specific deterrence because the consequences of the tragedy themselves have deterred the individual and they're usually an upstanding citizen with no antecedents and they've been good since and they've usually done lots of rehabilitation these are all the reported cases right um, you're not pitching the uh the non-custodial sentence for the person with a lengthy history usually um i won't commit to having never done it but um and then you have so you have this person that there is no good to them putting them in jail there is no good that they can take from jail there's no need to separate them from society it's denunciation and general deterrence i know and, and I just, if I think, I put the focus on that, I probably. Why did the scales tip that way, though? Why? How can it be that sentencing, highly individualized exercise, supposed to be applied with consideration for all these principles, and in every other type of offense, they get applied with, you know, the the rehabilitation and the specific deterrence and the need to separate the offender from society and the need to consider all available options short of jail before jailing somebody glidoo factors and all of that and then just well but they did it in a car so actually none of that is that much of an important consideration and especially because rehabilitation when you deal with impaired driving offenses is like should be a primary consideration and you ain't getting rehabilitated in jail one wonders if you're flying down the road on your bike dangerous speed just blasting across the bridge coming down a hill and somebody stepped out and you hit them you know and the speed it's dangerous you know dangerous speed you're going 60 kilometers an hour on a bicycle bicycles normally maximum speed might be criminal negligence causing death and you're convicted of dangerous driving causing death you couldn't be convicted of dangerous driving on a bicycle no electric bike pool noodle (laughs) pool noodle yeah exactly um Um, conveyance yeah um if you were convicted, I don't think you'd get jail if you were on a bike. Um, I think there's... Uh, you can't there's, be convicted on a bike. I, I know. I, I, I'm trying okay. to say... I'm trying to focus on something else. And that is... We look at people who are driving high-powered cars as using those high-powered cars. And in this case, using it and it having the same impact as using a weapon. Yes. And that is, I think, part of the issue there and you think about the person who's driving the audi at those speeds and you you there's a presumption of arrogance was it not this same case where the family was petitioning to try and create a new offense for like vehicular assault and vehicular homicide to change it from dangerous or impaired driving causing death to oh no that's the Callius family but that happens all the time there's always somebody but it's that it's that type of thinking that leads to sentences like this that in my opinion 
are disproportionate to the gravity of the offense, the moral culpability of the offender, and society's interests. Well, in my opinion, there's a couple of good dangerous driving decisions. One of them was overturned. Um, sentencing decision where the judge said, you know, we really have to separate the damage here from the driving uh, and look at the gravity of the driving compared to everybody else's driving. Yeah, it falls in dangerous and yep, somebody did die. But it was the momentary, uh, you know, very short period of time of dangerous driving. Um, and if we look at the driving and it had been an accident without a death, we would have been looking at no jail. And you know, we shouldn't be, you know, just by virtue of the fact that, that somebody died, um, thin skull person maybe even dies, you know, that we shouldn't necessarily be, be upping the sentence so much to just reflect the fact that out of pure causation, someone died. Right. And I, I agreed with that and it was overturned, uh, at our court of appeal. Um, and I, always felt that that was a troubling thing to overturn I, I I you know I agreed with the uh with the trial judge who you know heard the facts and came to the conclusion with respect to the sentence but there was you know people upset in the public as we had in this case and uh I often wonder if that influences the decision on sentencing I, well, I will say that... If a judge is taking that into account, because I don't think the people will be up in arms over 18 months in jail for this fellow, and... There's uh, always people who are up in arms, no matter how much jail be some. you give them. There'll be some, no doubt. There's, but, yeah, there's always people who with, think there should be 20 years in jail. I think that with this judge, that wouldn't be a consideration, because remember, he had said before that he'd, like, receive death threats after the acquittal. Yeah. He still acquitted the guy. Yeah. Well, he sentenced him now. Yep. Well, Paul, that was all very just depressing. So um, can you give me some good news? Like maybe... The Ridiculous Driver of the Week. The Ridiculous Driver of the Week. Yay! This is uh, not a bad one. This was in Texas, not Florida. Sounds like something from Florida. Um, this fellow was... Uh, Apparently drunk and uh, wanted to do the right thing, um, which was go for ice cream. Um, what I do when right I'm drunk. Thing. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, but, of course, he also didn't want to drive when he was drunk. So what he did was he got his 13-year-old stepdaughter to drive okay. um, to go for ice cream. And, uh, of course, he was stopped. I mean, the 13-year-old didn't have a license. Yeah. Um, and, uh, apparently she had some trouble operating the motor vehicle too, because, you know, she didn't know how to drive. Um, so now he has been charged with child endangerment and criminal negligence. Um, and, um, she came very close to, uh, to crashing the car. So that was what, uh, <laughs> drew people's attention. So, so the important so thing is. He couldn't avoid uh, an accident even by having someone so else drive. We've seen cases <laughs> where people, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we've seen cases where, uh, you know, people had their, their learner, uh, relative or child or learner drive while the supervisor has been drinking. Sure. But uh, they're licensed. But, but they're licensed. And I mean, in that case, it seems to me that that would that's a logical step. Yeah. Uh, a little different when it's the, uh, for ice cream, 13, for all for ice cream. Old. It's not as like, you know, it's not like a situation where you've got to get home. Well, if only she were 14 and if only it were Alberta. And she had a learner's permit. Yes. Yeah. All of those things. So if it were just a completely different set of facts, it would be very boring. Sure. On a different planet. <laughs> yeah. Oh. With different laws. Yeah. <laughs> Other physics. Um, before we go, Paul, I wanted to give a shout out to one of our very early podcast guests. Yes. Uh, Tim Shuey. Oh, you're talking about Drive Smart BC. Drive so, Smart yes, BC. Yes, it was their 10 year anniversary on Twitter for Drive yep. Smart BC. Drive Smart BC is a fantastic resource, and it often comes up when I have a question 
I Google it and it comes up yeah, and answers the question for me. So, what do I need to know about this? Uh, so, yeah. So you're sitting there thinking to yourself, is it legal advice? You know, he's a former police officer. He's you giving know, pretty good thoughtful interpretation of the law. I usually find it like law. for like the jumping point to what section of the Motor Vehicle Act I need to look at. Like, what section is this? And I Google it, Drive Smart BC comes up, tells me the section, and then I go look at the law. It's so. an invaluable resource. Um, so good. And there's lots of police officers use it. And, uh, you know, just because, again, it comes up quickly in your, in your Google quickly. search. And it's well always organized. very... And thoughtfully written and everything. So, and it's not... You know, I would say early on when I would look at it, it seemed to be a little bit more judgmental. Uh, over the years, I think he's mellowed out. Yeah. Well, happy anniversary, Drive Smart BC. Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. And we will keep going with another episode of Driving Law next week. But if you have a driving law related question or need to get a hold of us between now and then, give us a call at 604 685 8889 or find us online at vancouvercriminallaw.com and tune in next week for another exciting episode of Driving Law.